Night school. Night school. Night school. How you doing? Good. Good. Today, I'm going to be talking about The Power of Now, A Guide to Spiritual Enlightenment by Eckhart Tolle. Uh, so you're familiar with this book? Mm-hmm. Have you read it before? Only the first 50 pages, because I read it before we started the podcast, when I would only read 50 pages of any given book. For sure. Um, but I have really special moments and memories with that book, reading it on the Ben Franklin Transit, and like looking around at the city while reading it, and doing like mindfulness yeah. exercises. It was great. Totally. So this book, I, I was planning on doing Gods of Eden, as mm-hmm. I mentioned on the last episode, that I was going to do Gods of Eden next, and or at least an alien book. Uh, I went to Barnes & Noble with Sarah on Friday, and I was looking for the alien section to see what alien books they had. And while I was looking around, I walked over to a section, and as I was approaching a shelf, there was no one around, like there was no one within 20 feet that I could see. And four books that were on a shelf just fell over like as I was approaching. And I thought that was odd. So I went and I looked at the books just to like pull that thread and see like, well, what's what's here? Is this maybe like a sign kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And the fourth book, the one on the right, it was like a book about how to become a mermaid. And then like a Deepak Chopra book. And then the one on the fourth side or the, the one on the far right where it fell to was this one. Read what the quote says at the bottom there. Read it out loud. Very cool. One of the best books to come along in years. Every sentence rings with truth and power. Deepak Chopra, author of The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, which is the last book we did on the podcast. Literally the last book we did on the podcast. Wow, that's really dope. And so when I approached initially, I was like, okay. And there was a Chopra book right next to it? Yes. Do you know which one? It wasn't that one. Huh. I don't remember now. There's only 80 (laughs) others. Right. So uh, like, I initially, when I approached, was like, well, I, I don't necessarily think this is anything, but then seeing that made me think like, okay, I should probably get this book. Dope. The fact that it's specifically referenced the book that we just covered, which I hadn't heard of until you covered it. Right. And all of a sudden that's on here. So I decided that's to get tight. this book and read through it. Uh, I liked it a lot. It's, um, I would say it's like a, it's a religious text. It's a book about how to live in the world in a way that, he would refer to as enlightened. Uh, And a lot of that is just about being in the moment and not focusing on the the past or the future. And I want to read, or actually before I get into it, the, this guy, Eckhart Tolle, he was born in 1948 in Germany. He's still alive. Uh, He went to college and was going to be a teacher. He did do some teaching while he was going through postgraduate school to become like a, a college professor And at 29, he finished his postgraduate degree and was going to then be a professor. What was he going to school for? Uh, I don't know actually what his degree was in, but he finished Mm. his postgraduate degree. So it was some sort of teaching thing. Could you look that up, Evan? Eckhart Tolle, E-C-K-H-A-R-T-T-O-L-L-E, what he went to school for. I want to read a little bit of the introduction here, which kind of tells uh, the story of how he came to some of the ideas that, that he goes over in this book. Mm. Uh, I thought this whole intro, I considered like just reading off the whole like seven pages of it, but I tried to cut it down a little bit here to, to uh, focus it a little bit. Let's go. One night, not long after my 29th birthday, I woke up in the early hours with a feeling of absolute dread. I had woken up with such a feeling many times before, but this time it was more intense than it had ever been. The silence of the night, the vague outlines of the furniture in the dark room, the distant noise of a passing train, everything felt so alien, so hostile, and so utterly meaningless that it created in me a deep loathing of the world. The most most loathsome thing of all, however, was my own existence. What was the point in continuing to live with this burden of misery? Why carry on with this continuous struggle? I could, feel, I could feel that a deep longing for annihilation, for non-existence, was now becoming much stronger than the instinctive desire to continue to live. I cannot live with myself any longer. This was the thought that kept repeating itself in my mind. Then suddenly I became aware of what a peculiar thought it was. Am I one or two? If I cannot live with myself, there must be two of me. The I and the self that I cannot live without. Maybe, I thought, only one of them is real. 
I was so stunned by the strange realization that my mind stopped. I was fully conscious, but there were no more thoughts. Then I felt drawn into what seemed like a vortex of energy. It was a slow movement at first and then accelerated. I was gripped by an intense fear and my body started to shake. I heard the words, resist nothing, as if spoken inside my chest. I could feel myself being sucked into a void. It felt as if the void was inside myself rather than outside. Suddenly there was no more fear and I let myself fall into that void. I have no recollection of what happened after that. I was awakened by the chirping of a bird outside the window. I had never heard such a sound before. My eyes were still closed and I saw the image of a precious diamond. Yes, if a diamond could make a sound, this is what it would be like. I opened my eyes. The first light of dawn was filtering through the curtains. Without any thought, I felt, I knew, that there is infinitely more to light than we realize. That soft luminosity filtering through the curtains was love itself. Tears came into my eyes. I got up and walked around the room. I recognized the room, and yet I knew that I had never truly seen it before. Everything was fresh and pristine, as if it had just come into existence. I picked up things, a pencil, an empty bottle, marveling at the beauty and aliveness of it all. That day I walked around the city in utter amazement at the miracle of life on earth, as if I had just been born into this world. Really liked that introduction. So cool. I really liked that sort of awakening story. <clears throat> and I especially liked that thought of, I cannot live with myself any longer. That, that is such an interesting realization and a thought that I haven't had before. That like, if you hate yourself, then you're not yourself then you're clearly something other than yourself if you hate yourself, because that doesn't make any sense. And that's very interesting. He then, after that, he spends two years of his life just sort of sitting on park benches, happy. He just spends a couple years being sort of homeless. He just hangs out in the park and just kind of looks around and is like, wow, isn't it all so incredible? And then he, like, he has friends. He sometimes is couch surfing. He's sometimes staying at a Buddhist monastery nearby. And sometimes he's just sleeping on the park bench because whatever, that's, that's good enough. So he does that for a couple years. Awesome. And then more and more he like, meets people that are aware that like, oh, this guy's like, he like, knows something. He's, like, not, he's not just a, like, a, he's not a crazy man. This is like a man who knows something. And more and more people started asking him, like, what is, what's going on? What is it that you know? And can you give me what you have? And the result of that was this book. So this book he initially published in 97. And at first, nobody read it. It was like they got it into a couple of local bookstores and a few of his friends read the book. And then he would have friends bring, bring copies of the books with them to like nearby cities if they were going there and like contact new agey kind of bookstores to have them put there. A few years later, Oprah got a hold of a copy. She loved it. And so she put it on her book list. How did Oprah magazine. get a hold of an unpopular book? I mean, I guess it got popular enough that it, by like, three years later, that it got yeah. into her lap somehow. Wow. But it was a book that was not that had not been popular up to that point. And three years after it was published, ended up being a New York Times bestseller for a long time because Oprah talked about it. So that's the reason that anybody really knows about the book at this point. That's tight. Um, I really love the... I love the way this book is written, and I love the way that it... Uh, the way that he takes so much from so many different religions and con constantly emphasizes the idea that there is only one spiritual path. And these are all different like flavors, cultural flavors of it. But right. there's one religious truth that they're all leading to. And mostly what that is, is you need to be in the moment. You need to not be thinking about the past or about the future. You need to be here now, as Ram Dass said. Mm -hmm. I, I have a bunch of uh, a quotes or a bunch of like uh, sections that I want to share here. Uh, I thought that a lot of this stuff would just be really good jumping off points for conversations and mm -hmm. comparisons to other things that we've talked about. Because mm -hmm. it is all very much a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the sort of spiritual teachings that resonate with me, I guess, are similar things where it's like being open to different religions and looking for the mutual truth in those things. The mind is a superb instrument if used rightly. Used wrongly, however, it becomes very destructive. To put it more accurately, it is not so much that you use your mind wrongly, you usually don't use it at all. It uses you. 
This is the disease. You believe that you are your mind. This is the delusion. The instrument has taken you over. It's almost as if you were possessed without knowing it, and so you take the possessing entity to be yourself. The beginning of freedom is the realization that you are not the possessing entity, the thinker. Knowing this enables you to observe the entity. The moment you start watching the thinker, a higher level of consciousness becomes activated. You then begin to realize that there is a vast realm of intelligence beyond thought, that thought is only a tiny aspect of that intelligence. You also realize that all the things that truly matter, beauty, love, creativity, joy, inner peace, arise from beyond the mind. You begin to awaken. I love the thought about the a higher level what was it a higher level of consciousness is activated mm -hmm. when you start to watch the thought yeah that's so watch cool. the thinker that's similar to his realization about which i are you then like just the realization that there's yeah. multiple levels to your mind can sometimes instantly catapult you to the to the logical conclusion of that like oh okay well if there's multiple levels of my mind what's the top one? oh you know yeah and then that can just end up triggering something in you yeah <clears throat> Instead of watching the thinker, you can also create a gap in the mind stream simply by directing the focus of your attention into the now. Just become intensely conscious of the present moment. This is a deeply satisfying thing to do. In this way, you draw consciousness away from your mind activity and create a gap of no mind in which you are highly alert and aware, but not thinking. This is the essence of meditation. Now, when he uses the term mind, he's referring to... All the, all the things that your brain does that he deems kind of separate from what you really are, which is God, or he uses many different words for it. He kind of switches to different words throughout. But you're really God, and your mind, he also puts like the physical world under that, and your body all kind of under the category of mind, and that you need to remember that you are not those things. Mm -hmm. So the single most vital step on your journey toward enlightenment is this. Learn to disidentify from your mind. Every time you create a gap in the stream of mind, the light of your consciousness grows stronger. One day you may catch yourself smiling at the voice in your head, as you would smile at the antics of a child. This means that you no longer take the content of your mind all that seriously, as your sense of self does not depend on it. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that idea. Uh, because I've, I've thought a lot about how, like, when you become, when you start just being thoughtful about understanding people and understanding that everybody's a result of the experiences that they've, they've had, mm -hmm. you can start just, like, like, when I, when I meet someone that I'm, like, if I'm working with someone that's, like, someone that recently graduated from high school, and he's, like, a, a lazy shithead, mm -hmm. and he's, like, kind of rude and makes jokes that are mean, it's, like, I don't it's hard to get mad at that person. Right. It's like, I was, I was a lazy shithead when I was that age too. That's just what it is. Right. That's how it goes. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to kind of point that towards yourself now. Like, remember, like you're, you're a goof. Like, right. You're just a person and you're a result of your experiences and you, you can laugh at yourself. Yeah. And you're not that big a deal. It reminds me of one of the four agreements. Uh, don't take anything personally. I've never thought about applying that to my own person, to not to take the person that I am personally. That's interesting. <laughs> That's yeah. so weird. I've never but it read does that apply. Book. I need to do that. Yeah, that'd be a, another good one for us to do on the podcast. Um, it's also short, and it's really, really useful. And it's kind of like Deepak, uh, Deepak Chopra's Seven Laws of Spiritual Success, where it's like, here's a, seri here's a short list of rules to live by that that cover the whole thing. If you mm -hmm. can live by all four of these at the same time or all seven of these at the same time, you can break duality and play this game lucidly. Right. And it's all like different, it's all like really different routes to the same sort of thing. Yeah. I was reading, um, I was reading his Wikipedia page today, Eckhart Tolle's, and I read like the criticisms of him section. Mm -hmm. And I, it's so frustrating when people accuse spiritual teachers of being unoriginal. Like, yeah, no shit. No shit. Because it's the same thing that they've been saying forever. Right. He's not making something up. He he's didn't not, like, invent God. He's not inventing a new kind of God. Right. He doesn't have to write, like, <clears throat> like they act as though you've ripped off the story. Like you're a right. joke thief. You've ripped off someone else's stuff. It's like, no, these are, it's the truths. And 
different people have all said the different well, truths. Well, that's funny because it, if you're if you're dealing with finite dualistic content like stand up comedy jokes, mm-hmm. if you say the same exact joke that someone else did, the reason that that's wrong is that you could have made a new joke, but instead you took an old joke. But mm-hmm. when it comes to the eternal truth, the infinite truth, the non dual truth, you you can't make a new one. Right. It's you can just never make a ever ever going to happen. You can just talk about it a different way. Right. I've heard, and I've heard, uh, I don't know if we've talked about him, but uh, are you familiar with Dr. Jordan Peterson? Mm. <laughs> Far right? Far right, yeah. yeah he's yeah. kind of a lunatic racist, but okay. uh, he's been criticized for being unoriginal. Like, <laughs> well, he's talking about the Bible. <laughs> he's talking about the Bible. <laughs> he didn't write the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's unoriginal. <laughs> uh, That's hilarious. Basically, all emotions are modifications of one primordial, undifferentiated emotion that has its origin in the loss of awareness of who you are beyond name and form. Because of its undifferentiated nature, it is hard to find a name that precisely describes this emotion. Fear comes close, but apart from a continuous sense of threat, it also includes a deep sense of abandonment and incompleteness. It may be best to use a term that is as undifferentiated as that basic emotion— and simply call it pain. One of the main tasks of the mind is to fight or remove that emotional pain, which is one of the reasons for its incessant activity. But all it can ever achieve is to cover it up temporarily. In fact, the harder the mind struggles to get rid of that pain, the greater the pain. The mind can never find the solution, nor can it afford to allow you to find the solution, because it is itself an intrinsic part of the problem. Imagine a chief of police trying to find an arsonist when the arsonist is the chief of police. You will not be (laughs) free of that pain until you cease to derive your sense of self from identification with the mind, which is to say, from ego. The mind is then toppled from its place of power, and being reveals itself as your true nature. I like that idea of sort of combining that, and I thought thought that the, the way to describe it here it also includes a deep sense of abandonment and incompleteness. Mm. I like that. I, and I think it rings I think it rings so true for so many people that like they just feel like they're missing something and they don't exactly know what it is. A, a god-shaped hole, I guess mm-hmm. people call it. Yeah, I was going to say the term abandonment is kind of a Christian flavored way to describe um the dualistic trap, the estrangement from infinity or whatever you want to call it it's kind of a yeah. christian flavor because they they personify being and say it's like someone we need but don't have anymore and that's a good way for them to think about us to think about it whatever it's it's, it's one way to package it yeah but I, I always i always feel whenever i hear about like um this this book is a direct description of the highest truth. And a lot of the ways that the highest truth is um, expressed is not direct description, like especially in the West. Like the, I mean, the Bible is not necessarily just a Western book um, because a lot of the shit happened in the Middle East, but it's still like the fundamental description of this truth for the Western world. And I always just feel like, God, this thing is like, like the Bible is like this broken down for a two-year-old. You know what I mean? I always mm-hmm. just feel like, gosh, our metaphors are so childish. Like, yeah. there was a dad in the sky, and you, you fell away from him because an animal tricked you. And it's like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. can we just get to the point? Yeah. We got to just have different, we got to have different flavors of that. Because we do. I love the way that he talks about it. I love the direct way that he describes it. Of course. That works for me. But right. it doesn't work for everybody. Everybody right. needs kind of a different a different version of that. And maybe there's a much more direct way, a much more like physics based way that for me would be like, what are you talking about? Like you could go more direct than this, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's I, what, I love the way he talks about it. That's what MIU does with the unified field. That's what that's what the class Foundations of Physics and Consciousness was doing. Is it was trying to explain where this truth is located in the physical world, which is in the unified field, which is everywhere. Um, ah. That was the point of what MIU was trying to do with that. It's like for somebody who is living in a scientific, uh, in, a, in a science-based paradigm, and by that I mean a worldview based on facts they perceive to be scientifically established, how do you take them from there to God? 
and it right. is through the through the concept of the unified field. Without the unified field, they're still just running around chasing their tail. But if you put the unified field in there and then connect it to these philosophies, and you can actually get somebody there through through science. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, very scientific way to do it. Yeah. As long as you are unable to access the power of the now, every emotional pain that you experience leaves behind a residue of pain that lives on in you. It merges with the pain from the past, which was already there, and becomes lodged in your mind and body. This accumulated pain is a negative energy field that occupies your body and mind. If you look on it as an invisible entity in its own right, you are getting quite close to the truth. It's the emotional pain body. Some pain bodies are obnoxious but relatively harmless. For example, like a child who won't stop whining. Others are vicious and destructive monsters, true demons. Some are physically violent. Many more are emotionally violent. Some will attack people around you or close to you, while others may attack you, their host. Thoughts and feelings, thoughts and feelings you have about your life then become deeply negative and self-destructive. Illnesses and accidents are often created in this way. Some pain bodies drive their hosts to suicide. Once the pain body has taken you over, you want more pain. You become a victim or a perpetrator. You want to inflict pain, or you want to suffer pain, or both. There isn't really much difference between the two. The pain body, which is the dark shadow cast by the ego, is actually afraid of the light of your consciousness. It is afraid of being found out. Its survival depends on your unconscious identification with it, as well as on your unconscious fear of facing the pain that lives in you. But if you don't face it, if you don't bring the light of your consciousness into the pain, you will be forced to relive it again and again. The pain body may seem to you like a dangerous monster that you cannot bear to look at, but I assure you that it is an insubstantial phantom that cannot prevail against the power of your presence. That's tight. It is such that an is interesting tight. concept. The, and like... The thing about how you want more pain when it takes over, yeah, man, that's so, so true. true. So true, man. When I'm mad, I don't want to be not mad. Right. I want to. I want to. I want someone to be mad at. I want something like, what's going on here? What's yeah? The best thing you could get is an even better reason to be even more mad. Oh, you see fuck, that yeah. your attention's going straight there, right? So, I love that. I love that idea and the idea that like everybody kind of has their own different flavor of that of this sort of amalgamation of all your shitty behavior picture it as a person picture it as like a being that lives in you mm -hmm. that sometimes ends up taking over you in moments of weakness whenever something happens that weakens you then this thing is allowed to take over you and is allowed to do whatever it wants and just sort of rampage if it wants to mm -hmm. and i love the idea of personifying that whether true or not although i i think he believes that it's very literally like an entity yeah uh and these this and the thinker are sort of two entities that he refers to kind of throughout the whole book he even kind of draws a parallel between like that men struggle seem to struggle and he does say like of course there's exceptions to this different people are different but men men tend to struggle with the thinker like the thinker tends to take over them and be the thing that leads them astray. Mm -hmm. But women tend to struggle more <clears throat> with the pain body, that that is what tends to mm -hmm. lead them astray, that leads them away from what you really are, away from being in the now. Mm -hmm. He even talks about like how he, he thinks a lot of that is due to the fact that it's like physically more uncomfortable to be a woman. And that like mm. he like says that PMS basically pushes you into the pain body in a lot of cases. Right. It's an interesting thought. Um, but yeah, I really love that pain <clears throat> body concept. Can I tell you a random uh, fun tidbit I learned on Gaia this week about attention and demons? Yeah. So I watched a documentary about Stanislav Grof, who okay. could be called the father of psychedelic psychotherapy. Albert Hoffman said that he did more to further the research of LSD than anyone. So he was a pioneer on this shit. Okay. He was leading a workshop, and basically when... He would have like rooms full of dozens of people who were going through psychedelic experiences and sitters would just walk around and tend to who needed to be tended to. And if she hit the fan, they would call um, Stanislav Graf. Um, and he wrote a bunch of books about, about this stuff too. His books are still the most cited on, on LSD psychotherapy. Um, so 
a demon manifested in a person who was in an LSD experience, and he started lashing out and threatening to kill the sitters. So they called Stanislav over. Um, he went over to him, and um, it was a girl, but she was shouting in this deep voice that wasn't her voice, and she was using information that that person didn't even know. Like, Ooh. they didn't give the details, but, like, they, yeah. he, this demon knew things that that woman couldn't have even known, was, like, spewing information and giving threats. And Stanislav, uh, he, he never broke his total trust and total curiosity, total faith, total trust, total curiosity. And he looked at the demon, he said, you don't even know where you are. You don't even know where you came from. You don't even know who you are. And the demon just started to melt. And it sounded like he was saying, you're God, stupid. You're not this. But a lot of the conversation, it sounds like was happening psychically, was happening silently. But he hmm. looked at him and said, you don't even know where you are. You don't even know where you came from. I've never heard of somebody saying something like that to a demon. They always say, get out or whatever. Yeah, that's but a unique it, exorcism. Yeah, and it made me think, man, I wonder if the Catholicized exorcism concept is designed to make people more afraid of demons like you need to go to you need to battle with the demon you need to ooh, with the demon yeah it's like oh but but they stanislav Grof handled demonic possession multiple times in these lsd sessions and he always did it with total friendliness politeness and curiosity and just a good nature and towards it would just, the it would demon? Towards the demon. You said, like, and you mentioned trust before, and I wasn't quite sure what you meant by that. Well, not trusting, um, as in everybody else was afraid that the woman was going to physically attack, and he was oh. totally unafraid. Okay. And so I think what he was trusting was the, potent, this is my own projection on it, but I think he might have been trusting the order of nature that God has established that doesn't allow a demon to attack a person in a situation like that. Mm -hmm. Um, like trusting God's laws, or or maybe he was trusting the demon. I don't know, but um, they didn't use the word trust. That's something that I put on it, but it was just like he was totally unafraid, totally comfortable, totally casual, totally polite, friendly, good-natured, and curious. They they used yeah. that word several times. He was he approached them with curiosity. Yeah, so incredible because it's like his whatever state of consciousness Stan was in was some kind of light that pushed them that they would they would just start to melt and then the woman would just feel incredible afterwards and just be absolutely fine. Wow. Yeah. I I think a lot about like about fear and about how not having fear seems to be important when dealing with all sorts of odd things. Right. With right. all sorts of demons, aliens, uh jinn, whatever, like ghosts. Fear, it, uh, fear douchebags at the bar. For sure. I mean, yeah. have you ever had yeah, somebody fair. get kind of buck with you and you just, hey, you know, and you're friendly with them and they just kind of, it just kind of disarms them because they, it's it like, feels it takes, like I have, yeah. it takes two to tango and you don't tango and you just, what are you talking about, man? What's you going know? on here? Yeah. It yeah. really can just diffuse any situation. Right. Well, I don't want to say that. Probably not any. Not any. But it is like, if you, if you don't have fear, I think that there is some, spiritual defense that that gives you mm. in certain instances but whether it does or doesn't we know it can work on a douchebag at the bar so it's at least worth a shot if you right. can be if you can do your best to be fearless in a situation where you meet like encounter something spooky it seems like right it couldn't possibly be a bad idea yeah to yeah. be fearless yeah. yeah wait so i have i have one idea real quick yeah. when you say uh when you say that it's possible that having no fear gives you a defense against spiritual things. Would it be more accurate to say that fear makes you vulnerable to spiritual things that are bad, but the natural state is fearlessness and the natural state is total safety. But once fear enters you, then there's some threat because that establishes that safe state as the foundational state rather than the fearful and vulnerable state as the foundational state. You know what I mean? Uh, Maybe. So, uh, like, okay, so if you go out into a football game, mm -hmm. I say, I'm giving you a helmet. This is a defense against the other players. Yep. The reason I'm giving you that is that the natural state of a football game is dangerous because you're supposed to hit each other, depending mm -hmm. on the position that you're in. So, if you're in a position where you're going to get hit, I give you a helmet. This is a defense. It is a defense because the natural state of the football field is that you're vulnerable and you're going to be hit. Yeah. 
But the natural state of being is not that you're going to be hit. The natural state of being is that you're going to be in total harmony with everything else. And mm -hmm. so it's not that you need a defense. You know what I mean? Yeah, maybe it's... Because I suppose when I typically hear about like how fear is uh, a bad thing in dealing with stuff like that is it's like it they want the fear in some way that the fear right. in some way nourishes them so maybe it is more like you're like fueling if you give fear that like that gives them something it like gives them yeah, something yeah. to work with right either either it's like maybe a food for them in some sense or maybe it's a situation where it just gives them ammo. It just, they realize like, oh, okay, I see how he's weak in this way. And I'm just going to yell at him more about this. Like, Oh, like it gives him a thread to pull? Like a specific, like maybe you put off a specific flavor of fear and it like tells them something about like, why are you afraid of me? What is right. it about me that, that makes you scared? And right. then it can push that button more. Yeah. That it could be just like ammo that's being given maybe. Yeah. I certainly think about it that way too. Yeah. Yeah. As long as the egoic mind, and egoic mind refers, like, ego being the person that, the thinker, the person that can take over if you are living in an unconscious way. As long as the egoic mind is running your life, you cannot truly be at ease. You cannot be at peace or, for, or fulfilled, except for brief intervals when you obtained what you wanted, when a craving has just been fulfilled. Uh, since the ego is a derived sense of self, it needs to identify with external things. It needs to be both defended and fed constantly. The most common ego identifications have to do with possessions, the work you do, social status and recognition, knowledge and education, physical appearance, special abilities, relationships, personal and family history, belief systems, and often also political, nationalistic, racial, religious, and other collective identifications. None of these is you. Do you find this frightening, or is it a relief to know this? All of these things you will have to relinquish sooner or later. Perhaps you find it as yet hard to believe, and I am certainly not asking you to believe that your identity cannot be found in any of those things. You will know the truth of it for yourself. You will know it at the latest when you feel death approaching. Death is a stripping away of all that is not you. The secret of life is to die before you die, and find that there is no death. I, I really liked that because of the, the die before you die part. Have you heard that phrase before? Yeah, Alan Watts. Alan Watts said that, huh? Mm -hmm. I remember hearing it from, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that it all has similar roots, but there is that book that came out recently. Uh, it was written like last year, and it was about that sort of secret history of the that type of psychedelic. Yeah, uh, uh, Graham Hancock. Lucinian Mysteries. Yes, yeah, the Eleusinian Mysteries, some sort of place in Greece where people would go and take some sort of psychedelic, and the whole point was that you would go there to die before you die. They would put you in total darkness for, like, several days. I haven't even, you know, I haven't even heard, like, what the process is or, like, what exactly they did, but I know that, like, the, the goal of it, as explained by, his name was John something, but it's a really hard to pronounce last name, I believe, uh... But according to him, it was dying before you die. That was like why you went there. And then you left there with some sort of deeper understanding of reality. And I think he implied that Jesus might have gone there. I, mm. I think he said that. I, mm. I could be wrong, though. I just heard him on a podcast, I believe, is where he was talking about that. I also recently heard, sorry, I can't remember where, that the Great Pyramid was an initiation site where people would go in and do a ritual like that that would take multiple days. And that, and, it's, and somehow we've involved them like being so lost in the darkness that the astral projected out of the room. Um, I can't remember exactly mm. how that tied into it, but that they would naturally leave the room. It's like if you give somebody psychedelics and just leave them in a dark room for a couple of days, they'll they'll naturally just escape the room but then they'll go back to their body and then they'll they'll go out and they've died they've left their body and they've died um wow. supposedly that was going on in the great pyramid but oh one other connection there is he said uh that the ego the egoic mind constantly needs to be defended mm -hmm. and uh we just heard that same thing in chopra uh he said you waste so much of your time defending yourself 
And then mm. he drew the difference between object referral and self-referral, object referral being uh, defined by externals, self-referral being defined by the infinite eternal self. Mm -hmm. And so that's so cool. That paragraph was like, uh, even use the same words. Like, yeah, he didn't quite say object referral, but he said something very, very close to it. Since the ego is a derived sense of self, it needs to identify with external things. It needs to be both defended and fed constantly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I really liked this section. It kind of talks about something that uh, me and Sarah and Sean have talked a lot about. And we were, we've been using this term before I uh, took the idea of a demon as seriously as I do now. Mm -hmm. But I've always referred to it, we referred to it as the time demon. And mm -hmm. it's just that thing when you start going like, ah, I don't have very much time left in the night and I don't know what I want to do. And like, I know, I know I have stuff that I need to get done, but like, I also, I'm just feeling lazy and I don't want to do any of that. And then you just like, you just start puttering around or doing something that is really short term, non-committal like get out your phone and just like end up scrolling through shit because yeah. you're sort of avoiding making a decision. But at the same time, you are making it worse by like digging the hole deeper and deeper as you don't make a decision. Right. Uh, and this reminded me a lot of that and was a really interesting way to, to look at it. Learn to use time in the practical aspects of your life. We may call this clock time but immediately return to the present moment awareness when those practical matters have been dealt with. In this way, there will be no buildup of psychological time, which is identification with the past and continuous compulsive projection into the future. I love that phrasing, continuous compulsive projection into the future, because that is a mm. tough one, because you can start getting in your head and being like, well, I need to figure out, like, I need to make a plan. But, like, you can make a plan and then just, like, keep thinking about it. And just you're just constantly thinking about what could go wrong with the plan or whether you should do something different and just sort of stressing about it. Right. And it can feel like, oh, this is good. I, I should be doing this because I, I need to make sure that it goes well. But it can get out of control. And I love that way of putting it. Right. Uh, continuous compulsive projection into the future. And it continues. Uh, clock time is not just making an appointment or planning a trip. It... It includes learning from the past so that we don't repeat the same mistakes over and over, setting goals and working toward them, predicting the future by means of patterns and laws, physical, mathematical, and so on, learned from the past, and taking appropriate action on the basis of our predictions. But even here, within the sphere of practical living, where we cannot do without reference to past and future, the present moment remains the essential factor. Any lesson from the past becomes relevant and is applied now. Any planning, as well as working toward achieving a particular goal, is done now. The enlightened person's main focus of attention is always the now, but they are still peripherally aware of time. In other words, they continue to use clock time, but are free of psychological time. That's mm. a really interesting balance to try That's and strike. Awesome. But a good way to view it so that someone like me could think about it in a in a productive way, I guess. Yeah, when I read when I read the beginning of this book, I had a roommate named Kendall on Chi Wei, mm -hmm. and I told Kendall about this book. He was kind of open-minded, um, but he, when I told him about this book, he's like, you can't live in the now all the time. I'm like, this book is about how you can live in the now all the time. You can always pay attention in the present moment instead of thinking about the past or the future. He's like, that's impossible. Like, you have to think about the past and the future to even function. And then we got into it. We just were just like goats, just banging our heads together and got nowhere. Yeah. And uh, I wish that I would have read a little bit more of the book yeah, because I can see 56. you're only like. It was on page 56. I told you I read 50 <laughs> pages. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a really smart distinction because you can also be living in the moment when you look at your calendar to see what you're doing in the future. You're fully just sitting there looking at your calendar. That's all your yeah. attention is on. Yeah. Like you're not like looking at the calendar while you're watching like TV at the same time. That's so bad. We gotta watch two screens now, dude. We gotta control. stop watching two screens. One is enough, right? It's nuts, and that's why I just gave you a TV. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even I haven't tried using it yet. Oh, I bet. No, I w yeah, we weren't gonna. <laughs> it's gonna sit in your guest room and do nothing. 
Maybe someday. Maybe it'll do something. All negativity is caused by an accumulation of psychological time and denial of the present. Unease, anxiety, tension, stress, worry, all forms of fear are caused by too much future and not enough presence. Guilt, regret, resentment, grievances, sadness, bitterness, and all forms of non-forgiveness are caused by too much past and not enough presence. Most people find it difficult to believe that a state of consciousness totally free of all negativity is possible, and yet this is the, libera and yet this is the liberated state to which all spiritual teachings point. It is the promise of salvation, not in an illusory future, but right here and now. I, I really liked the way that that broke down all the negative ways that you could feel into very clean categories that make a lot of sense, either mm -hmm. putting them in like, you're tripping about the future or you're tripping about the past. Mm -hmm. And like, they all fall into those categories very neatly. Right. And I, I like, I guess I, I like that categorization. I mm -hmm. like looking at it that way. If you're ever like, you need to be fearless and you need to be forgiving. Those right. are two, those feel like two such core things to being. Fearless and forgiving. Yeah. yeah. That's a great combination. Yeah. And I don't, <clears throat> I don't even know what else I really want to, want to add to that there. That feels like it covers, it covers so much in terms of, uh. And you can add a qualifier to forgiving, like totally forgiving. Because forgiving sure. is subjective. Like forgiving could be a certain amount of forgiveness. You could be fearless, totally, and a little forgiving. So yeah. maybe you could add something like that. But if, yeah, I think if you're totally fearless and totally forgiving, I can't think of anything else you'd have to add to that. Well, maybe love. Love is also going to naturally exist if you have no fear and no resentment. But it's a short list of don'ts. It's a, yes. it's a very clean, tiny list of don'ts. Like No fear, no resentment. Don't be afraid and forgive everything. Right. Understand everything, forgive everything. Right, right. I love that. Also, I, I, I like another thing I wanted to say about the way that this book is written. A lot of it is question and answer. A lot of it is like, here's, here's my point, and then it goes to like, but hey, but why would you do that when like you need to think about the future? And he's like, I'm glad you asked. And then like explains it. So right, right. Because for years he was like getting these questions and like trying to understand everything that everybody is going to ask him about this. So he very much tries to fend off any que like any objections that people would have. And yeah. Just like answer all those questions during it. He mentions that like some of the questions, like a lot of the questions are things that, that he has directly gotten potentially repeatedly. A lot of the questions are just like mashup questions of like, this is the kind of thing that people ask or things that like the publisher threw in. But I think it's a, mm -hmm. it's a really good way to write something like this. I think it is. Just we talked about that with the Bhagavad Gita too, and how some of the uh, Gnostic gospels are written that way. When you write something at your, you've found some sort of secret that's very, very abstract, and the best mm -hmm. way to present it is to present a question-and-answer format where people who don't get it just ask you. Yeah. Like, that's what makes also the freaking podcast theories of everything with Carl whatever. Kurt Jaimungal. Kurt Jaimungal. Thank you. Yeah, theories of everything with Kurt Jaimungal. Um, he's a, he's a uh, very trained mathematician, but he still interviews people that, like... Uh, like Rupert Spira, for example, who wrote The Nature of Consciousness, we did mm -hmm. right before I started at MIU. Uh -huh. He interviewed him for four and a half hours, and he yeah. asked him every single stupid question on his mind. He didn't try to sound like, oh, I'm chopping it up with you. He attacked and questioned constantly. Yeah. And it's like, God, this is such a useful format. Yeah, I, I love him. I love, I love what he's doing. I've listened to a couple more besides the Chris Langan one. Mm -hmm. A couple of, like, a few different ones about like people in the UFO field. Yeah. He, he has like, a lot of UFO stuff on there. Yeah. He's really into that lately. Uh, and I love it. And I love the way he's like now on the ship, what were their faces like, or were, did you see any screens? And he just like, he just yeah. asks really minute questions. And sometimes, sometimes the guests get like kind of annoyed with him. Like, right. I, I kind of already answered this. And he's like, I know I'm being unnecessarily persnickety, but understand that I only seek knowledge. Right, <laughs> right. It's so it's such a likable way. That He's he, like a full time disciple. People. Like, what do you do for a living? Oh, I disciple. <laughs> yeah, I get all I get all the teachers to teach me. Yeah, and I ask them nitty gritty little questions, and they roll their eyes and answer them right. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> 
He's great. He's great. The time-bound mode of consciousness is deeply embedded in the human psyche. But what we are doing here is part of a profound transformation that is taking place in the collective consciousness of the planet and beyond. The awakening of consciousness from the dream of matter, form, and separation. The ending of time. We are breaking mind patterns that have dominated human life for eons. Mind patterns that have created unimaginable suffering on a vast scale. I am not using the word evil. It is more helpful to call it unconsciousness or insanity. Mm. I like... I like him sort of uh, also tapping into like that great awakening idea uh, that I, I mean, I hear it more and more because of the, the books that we read, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a very widespread belief that like, you know, people are like waking up more and more and feels like it's true. And it's so, yeah. uh, it feels so, the world feels so interesting right now in yeah. that a bunch of people are waking up and a bunch of people are getting deeply sleepy. And it's true. The, the, both the things are happening at the same time. And so yeah. it feels like such an interesting like conflict that's happening. And it's going right. to be a photo finish. Like which one ends up, are we going to win this? Are, are people going to wake up or right. are they going to be able to put us all to sleep? Right. And I don't know. Yeah. But I think that well, I Elon think Musk is now the largest shareholder of Twitter. So that's, that's a good sign. I think so. He just bought like a, like 11% of Twitter. Yeah. And they put him <laughs> on the board. Dude, so that's now he's filthy. now he's in there making decisions too. Yeah. Oh, that's so filthy. That bro. was that's okay. so filthy. Let's just let's just touch on it for a second here. I thought it was so cool how like because it's it's so similar to what he did with Dogecoin mm -hmm. or or with Tesla. He tweets Tesla stock too high IMO, stock drops. He can buy back back a bunch of the stock. He just like it's insider trading, but it's just him. Like it's no, he's just, doing it with the public. I know, I know. It's, it's like, like populist. Yeah, he just has such sway over the public that he can go, I think this is bad, and then people sell it, and he goes, okay, I can I can have it now. <laughs> he can just do that. And it was the same thing with That's Dogecoin, hilarious. where he just... And they find him like a million dollars, like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he can just go on Twitter and be like, please answer this poll very, very seriously. Do you think that free speech is an important thing on Twitter? Uh these this answer like this answer will affect things like you put out these polls in a very earnest way people respond to it twitter stock drops he buys a bunch of twitter now he's on the board so he shit on twitter in a very direct and truthful way it, like just told That's people so like savage. let's be fucking serious this is a problem right and everyone's like yes this <clears> is a problem <throat> stock drops he buys it he's on the board now he's probably going to fix it it's great. That's crazy. It's crazy, crazy that he has the power to do that. That is absolutely crazy. And that's clearly somebody who is awake in the way that we're talking about, who is... Uh, I think so. Or he's very convincing. Yeah, but... Nah. I mean, I'm convinced. That's all I'm saying. I'm yeah. convinced. So I, we'll I, see. I think, he's, I think he's a force for good, generally, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, time will tell. Time will tell. Ages. I liked this. This is just a, a little anecdote, but I, I thought it was so interesting to hear. Carl Jung tells in one of his books of a conversation he had with a Native American chief who pointed out to him that in his perception, most white people have tense faces, staring eyes, and a cruel demeanor. He said, they're always seeking something. What are they seeking? The whites always want something. <laughs> they're always uneasy and restless. We don't know what they want. We think they are mad. <laughs> I love that. Like, yeah. <laughs> we go in there and say, can, can we, like, we're going to take this land. And they're like, what does that even mean? <laughs> take what? You're going to take it? You can't have. <laughs> What's have? That's so funny. It's just, yeah, such an interesting they perspective. They have harsh faces and staring eyes, and they always want something. They're always seeking. What are they seeking? <laughs> They're always looking around seeking something. I don't like it. That's hilarious. Yeah. Not that they didn't have their own little wars and everything, but <laughs> definitely a lot more awake than we were at the time. Seems like it, yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that you should be doing but are not doing it? Get up and do it now. Alternatively, completely accept your inactivity, laziness, or passivity at the moment, if that is your choice. Go into it fully. Enjoy it. 
Be as lazy or as inactive as you can. If you go into it fully and consciously, you will soon come out of it. Or maybe you won't. Either way, there is no inner conflict, no resistance, no negativity. Nice. I love that. That's certainly an internal conflict that I've had many times. Of course. When you've course. got a day off and it's like, I could play video games or I could mow the lawn. But then oftentimes so you So you end just up play video games and think about the lawn? Yes, exactly. <laughs> you play the video games and think like, I'm a piece of shit. I'm a piece of shit. Uh, right, oh, right. Oh, man. Uh, I don't even... I'm not responsible. Right. I, I do... I actually just recently, I reset my schedule, you know, because I just switched jobs and stuff. Tuesday is my day off where I'm not allowed to do anything. And every other day I work hard because I can't take half day, like halfway, like, oh, Saturday, I got a couple things to do. And then the rest of the day I can relax. Doesn't work. Doesn't fucking work. Yeah, it's a good way to do it. I just need to have a day where I'm just grounded. Because I think the Sabbath thing, I'm like, okay, I need to just do it because it makes perfect sense. You have to have one day where all productivity is locked out. And if you don't do that, you'll go mad. Yeah, one out of seven seems fair. Yeah. Yeah, at least. Yeah. At least. You do three out of seven if you want, but one out of seven at least. Yeah. You got to have at least a whole day from waking up to going to sleep where you didn't expect yourself. And so this Tuesday, um, we had to fucking bring the cat to the vet. <laughs> uh, damn. <laughs> Which is actually funny because Jesus specifically says, like, well, you can take care of a sick animal on the Sabbath. Remember does that? Does he really say that? Yeah, because he does. He walks into the temple on the Sabbath because he's just trolling Jews, right? So he walks into the temple and heals a man on the Sabbath. And they go, he worked on the Sabbath. He healed somebody. And he goes, really? So What? Really, that's why they crucified him. So he goes, really? So if you were at home and your sheep fell into your well and it was the Sabbath, you would just wait till the next day to get it out? That's how I see this man right here. And they're like, oh, fuck, fucking fuck this guy. Kill him. And, the, <laughs> and he ultimately did get killed. Like the crime on paper was violating the Sabbath. I don't know if it was that specific thing. Huh. Um, but yeah, it's like, oh, fuck. Jesus specifically said if our cat gets hurt, we can just take care of that on the Sabbath. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Consciousness takes on the disguise of forms. Consciousness takes on the disguise of forms until they reach such complexity that it completely loses itself in them. In present-day humans, consciousness is completely identified with its disguise. It only knows itself as form and therefore lives in fear of the annihilation of its physical or psychological form. This is the egoic mind, and this is where, we cons and this is where considerable dysfunction sets in. It now looks as if something had gone very wrong somewhere along the line of evolution, but even this is part of Lila, the divine game, which it mentioned earlier. It's apparently a Hindu concept that the whole world is a game that God is playing. Finally, the pressure of suffering created by this apparent dysfunction forces consciousness to disidentify from form and awakens it from its dream of form. It regains self-consciousness, but it is at a far deeper level than when it lost it. This process is explained by Jesus in his parable of the lost son, who leaves his father's home, squanders his wealth, becomes destitute, and is then forced by his suffering to return home. When he does, his father loves him more than before. The son's state is the same as it was before, yet not the same. It has an added dimension of depth. The parable describes a journey from unconscious perfection through apparent imperfection and evil to conscious perfection. This felt like a fresh insight when I read it. Did have we talked? I mean, we talked about we, we did, did a, a whole basic, episode, practically a whole episode on that story, and yeah. we never caught its allusion to the return to non-dualism. Right, and it, well, the, the thing that was interesting to me is the idea that it's now that he, this son, is now better because he's he's like deeper and wiser because he. Mm went bad and then became good again. So he like understands how evil. to get back from bad. Now right. he knows the breadcrumb trail from bad to good. Right. Cause there's the son that stayed and the son that partied and the son that stayed, he has very little understanding of evil because he has barely, he's just stayed with the good and stayed in that. So he doesn't, he doesn't have the depth that the brother that went out and partied and then came home has right because that person understands the world on a deeper level right 
And th that's a really interesting insight and interesting way of looking at it that I, I suppose I didn't quite grasp before. Me neither. Not at all. And that's really interesting. It, it reminds me of like, I, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but there's been many times where I've met like a younger person or maybe just a person who hasn't thought a lot about what the, uh, what the thing they're saying is, but like you can agree with somebody and yet still be like, yeah, but you don't know why you're right. Like you yeah. still have to like, you still have, you still have like several layers of going back and forth before you understand what you're saying. Right. Yes. You're saying the correct thing, but you're spouting it off from someone else. And I don't think you really truly get what you're saying. Right. So we agree, but no, you don't get why I, why I think that. You right. Don't really right. get it. Uh, that's why I tell non-Christians I'm Christians and, tell, and Christian and tell Christians I'm not Christian. <laughs> like, not literally, but I pretty much, you know, because it's like, uh, well, yeah, I too believe that if you profess, yeah. like, I, fuck just, off. Yeah. We're not talking about the same thing. Right, because they think, they're thinking at it, you're thinking of it on a deeper level than either one of them are. And either both of these people think they exactly. agree with you, but they don't really understand that you yet I kind you kinda do. Right, right. Not really. Right, yeah. right. So the um in the Rupert Spira interview, mm -hmm. uh Kurt offers him a Bible story and he gives a non dual interpretation of the Bible story. And Kurt's like, You should do something like Peterson did with the biblical series. Like you should do non dual interpretations of Christian scripture. And he didn't seem interested in doing that. And so I just want to put a put a bookmark in that and just say let's look into whether that's a thing because the the Western world is starving for that non dual interpretations of biblical stories. When you say non dual, so that's what um, you're saying, like beyond good and evil, like not looking at everything through like either good or bad. That I'm would not quite be sure what you mean by the term. Okay, so non dual means the level of reality that goes beyond any separation. Um, so if you read the, like the, the whole meta narrative of the Bible, right. According to most Americans is that once upon a time we had a perfect paradise with God, we chose to leave. He mm -hmm. came back in human form to rescue us. And now we need to figure it out. So that's a dual interpretation because it still assumes that the timeline is linear and finite and it still places at this us at the at somewhere on that finite timeline. Once upon a time, there's a beginning of time, and now we're here. So they're presenting the biblical scriptures in the context of finite, temporary, like t time. Okay. But if but so a non-dual interpretation of the biblical narrative is is like at the beginning of time we were in paradise. At the end of time we will be in paradise. God in human form assured that we would keep that direction. And ultimately right now, everything is perfect in the eyes of God and our okay. current experience of reality and all the suffering that goes along with our current experience of reality is illusory. But what's okay. ultimately real is God. That's a non-dual interpretation because it assumes, because it takes into account the level of reality that is infinite. Um, okay. And what you just shared was a non-dual interpretation of that story because what Eckhart Tolle is saying is that the son leaving and then fucking around and then coming back to the father mm -hmm. is alluding to the story that we're all living, which is that once upon a time we were eternal and infinite. Yeah. Then we became uh, temporal and we took form. We became ego. We became finite. We became confused. And now we are eventually going to reestablish that unity we had at the beginning of time. Right. And everything between the now and the now is an illusory game that doesn't exist. Yeah. So he's saying, no, that's a metaphor for the fact that we were once infinite, now finite, will be infinite again, and are always truly infinite. Um, so you could go through every single Bible story and explain how it alludes to our true nature being infinite. And so by non-dual, I mean the level of reality where there's no separation from anything to anything. Um, Got it. Okay. So the the... So heaven is a non-dual state, and also the Garden of Eden is a non-dual state because there's no separation between man and God or finite and infinite. Since okay. man, yeah. is, man is a symbol for finite in the Genesis story and God is a symbol for in, the infinite in the Genesis story. So that's, that's the, that's the non-dual state. Mm -hmm. In the Garden of Eden, with God, everything's perfect, nothing is separate. Oh, then we get separated. That's the birth of the dual state in Genesis. 
Okay. Um, that makes sense? Yeah, so the, 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 what is the two things in Duel is, like, God and the world? Like the In that one, yes. In okay. that example, yes. Gotcha. Yeah. But okay. the ultimate, like, the... The point of the point of living in the now is to enter the non dual state because when you're truly in the moment, there's no separation between yourself and your experience. There's no yep. experience, experienced and act I put it two at the same time. Experience, the experienced and the act of experiencing. That's three, but it's still dual because there's any separation. Mm-hmm. But okay. if you're completely in the moment, there's you don't have a conscious uh, differentiation between the experience, the experience, and the act of experiencing. You yeah. are experience. Yeah. And there's there's other, like, biblical stories in here, too. Like, it tells a story of, you know, I can't even, I, I can't remember. Well, well actually, enough, but fuck, he wrote a whole book like that. It's called A New Heaven, A New Earth. Did he really? Yeah. And, no. I've, and I don't know how much of the biblical stories he goes into. I've never read it, but in about 45 minutes, I read, like, about a third grade level, um, rebuttal to that book by an evangelical Christian writer. It was mm-hmm. hilarious. I found it at the at the library and I just sat down and read it. It, it, it was so funny. <laughs> um, just watching him like try to grasp what Eckert is saying and completely failing. He's like, this is old. This is nothing but Eastern spirituality. <laughs> this is what we believe is right. It's so fucking funny. It's a bunch of I said, mumbo I read, jumbo. I picked up the book. I said, are you kidding me? I read the whole thing cover to cover every <laughs> single word so that's so stupid i put it back on the shelf it's so funny that like like it worked for sure oh, somebody for his audience oh it fuck. worked yeah dude because all he needs is someone and th- there is no shortage of them someone who just like him <laughs> will just wants to dismiss anything that isn't uh the generally not even the bible the generally held belief about christianity <laughs> right 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 and as long as it's like uh, it's got good words. You can just go, okay, yeah, that sounds, that sounds good. I'm glad to understand right. that I don't need to read that book because it's just <laughs> spiritual mumbo jumbo and stealing from other religions. Right, right. He's just ripping off other religions. <laughs> <laughs> Look beyond the words. Uh, here's so this is like a a person questioning. I don't like the word sin. It implies that I am being judged and found guilty. I can understand that. Over the centuries, many erroneous views and interpretations have accumulated around words such as sin due to ignorance, misunderstanding, or a desire to control, but they contain an essential core of truth. If you are unable to look beyond such interpretations and so cannot recognize the reality to which the word points, then don't use it. Don't get stuck on the level of words. A word is no more than a means to an end. It's an abstraction. Not unlike a signpost, it points beyond itself. The word honey isn't honey. You can study and talk about honey for as long as you like, but you won't really know it until you taste it. After you have tasted it, the word becomes less important to you. You won't Mm. be attached to it anymore. Similarly, you you can talk or think about God continuously for the rest of your life, but does that mean you know or have even glimpsed the reality to which the word points? It is really no more than an obsessive attachment to a signpost, a mental idol. So if a word doesn't work for you anymore, then drop it and replace it with one that does work. If you don't like the word sin, then call it unconsciousness or insanity. That may get you closer to the truth, the reality behind the word, than a long misused word like sin, and leaves little room for guilt. That's tight. It's really good. That's really good advice. Because there are so many different, like... Uh, you know, based on different religions, there's different words for different things or different new agey kind of words in that whole category. But they're so often just synonyms and they've just got little, just little synonyms. different. Synonyms? Huh? Synonyms? Synonyms. Nice, nice. Uh, they're so often just mean the same thing, but just right. have a little different flavor for each person. Whether, whether you want to feel kind of spiritual or you want to be kind of uh, more proper, you know, whatever whatever suits you. And you right. can pick whatever you want. It, it doesn't really matter. Right. Do, do you know what, what the word sin means? Uh, yeah, yeah, you've told me. To miss. That yeah. it like originally meant missing the mark. But do you think that could be an allusion to non-dualism too? Because there's, like, uh, out of the whole target, the only place that you want to hit is the center of the target. And so, like, to give one other example of that, sometimes God is um, represented as the 
middle of a wheel and finite creatures are represented as the spokes of the wheel. Mm -hmm. And so God never moves. The wheel moves around it, but the thing in the center never moves. It always stays the same. So in a circle, the center often represents God. Okay. And so if you shoot an arrow and it hits directly the center of the target, you're sinless. But if you hit anywhere else, you're in sin. So if you're anywhere in the range of finite experience, you're living in sin. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand that, if if you're not grounded in your eternal nature, you're living in sin because you're missing the point. At the be- at the at the center, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, I don't know much about like the the origins of it, like in in terms of like how it started getting used that way. Yeah, me neither. Uh, but I do like I do always think of that when I hear the word sin. Like you telling me that a while back has changed the way I view the word sin. That's like, cool. I do view it a bit more lightly. When you think about it, it's like it's just m- missing. Like you just yeah, it's just a go- it's a m- little mistake instead of like a. Uh, like a damning thing on your record, yeah, something like that. Well, we were we were raised with a very um, harsh father who had that had that opinion that like, well, if somebody if somebody does something bad, they need to get bonked or they don't learn. It's like actually they learn better if they don't get bonked. Yeah, they learn better if it's just like, hey, you missed. They learn they learn better. Yeah, but a lot of people think like you 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 have to be met with harshness or you don't learn, or maybe that's just an excuse. But. It seems like it's genuinely a misconception. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that for some people it's an excuse. For some people it's genuinely what they think. And for some people it's what they genuinely think because they're unconscious and they're not thinking about what they actually think. Right. Or uh, it's the thinker. So uh, they're already thinking, so that's already a problem. Right, (laughs) right. There is nothing you can ever do or attain that will get you closer to salvation than it is at this moment. This may be hard f- this may be hard to grasp for a mind accustomed to thinking that everything worthwhile is in the future. Nor can anything that you ever did or that was done to you in the past prevent you from saying yes to what is and taking your attention deeply into the now. You cannot do this in the future. You do it now or not at all. I love that. Like, That's tight. No, there's not like there's not like something you don't need to like build up to this. You don't need to like pump iron for a while before you can like get enlightened. No, no, you're you're there. Right. It's here right now if you can right. just do it. Yeah. If you can just really accept it for a second. But that's I suppose it's tricky because there's a lot of books written about it. Right. So yeah. Did did this book give you moments of enlightenment or bring you closer to enlightenment or make you feel enlightened? I wish that I had uh, given it more time to breathe. I think that that, that might have been the case because there is a lot of like, there's this odd symbol that's in the book. Mm-hmm. And whenever that symbol appears, it means like, I want you to stop and uh, sit and think on this idea for a minute. Like close your eyes and, and think about that concept. And, you know, maybe if I would have been actually stopping and like meditating for 30 seconds on, on each of these things, then maybe it would have. But I bought it on Friday and read 75% of it yesterday until 2 a.m. So <laughs> I wish I would have given it more time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I do think this is a book I'll read again, at, mm-hmm. least, at least parts of it. Yeah. yeah. Most of the so-called bad things that happen in people's lives are due to unconsciousness. They are self-created or rather ego-created. I sometimes refer to those things as drama When you are fully conscious, drama does not come into your life anymore. Let let me remind you briefly how the ego operates and how it creates drama. When egos come together, whether in personal relationships or in organizations or institutions, bad things happen sooner or later. Drama of one kind or another, in the form of conflict, problems, power struggles, emotional or physical violence, and so on. This includes collective evils such as war, genocide, and exploitation, all due to massed unconsciousness. Furthermore, many types of illness are caused by the ego's continuous resistance, which creates restrictions and blockages in the flow of energy through the body. When you reconnect with being and are no longer run by your mind, you cease to create those things. You do not create or participate in drama anymore. I like that idea that like, if you are really at peace, you don't start making shit. Right. Because you do make shit. That's good. I'm going to post that. I'm done with all the drama. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> I think that's a new Facebook status. 
Have you ever interacted with somebody and you have felt the urge to do something and then you like you so first the possibility of conflict emerges. Mm -hmm. Then you consider the possibility of doing something. Then you realize it doesn't feel right to do it. Then you realize it only didn't feel right to do it because you can't bring drama to that person. Like, have you ever felt like that? You lost me at the last part there because you can't bring drama to that person. Yeah. So I'll give you a concrete example. I, I was okay. hoping not to. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, Brent here at East Lake. Uh -huh. I sometimes bang my head up against Brent, like by, um, like maybe getting offended by something that he has said, or overthinking something that he forgot. And the way that the way that Brent operates, the pastor at the church that lets us use this room. Is, who has also done an episode. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. also been on it. Came on to talk about drugs. Um, he, The way he operates is if someone messes up around him, he, ex he does not expect an apology. If he messes up, he doesn't give an apology. He's like, I don't give a shit. You do something wrong, I do, just, we just go. We just go. He just goes. And so if you get offended, you're like, hey, stop and apologize. He's like, hey, come on, man, we're just going. It's like, all right. So what I mean is, like, I want to start drama, but a lot of the time, and I still, and I have a few times, mm -hmm. but most of the time, I'm like, whatever, I'll just let it go because he, like, he doesn't invite it. So that's what I'm saying. Have you ever had that interaction where you want to start drama, but they invite it so little that you can't? No, nothing that like comes to mind, although it feels familiar. What you're sure, saying, sure, sure. Uh, nothing specific comes to mind. Uh, but yeah, so then, so like with Brent, then usually it's not even a situation where if, because he would never even gets, he doesn't really get riled up really or anything, right? I'm sure he does. I'm sure he gets, ir I've seen him get frustrated and irritated, but he mm -hmm. doesn't hold a grudge. Like he doesn't like, oh, we need to talk to so-and-so, they fucked up. Like he invites people around him, even if they are uh, volatile, like he doesn't care. Like he'll let people around, like... I mean, he, he has a couple of people that he affiliates with that is like, ah, they're crazy. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 that's fine. Yeah, that's my crazy friend. And uh, maybe I'm the crazy friend. But he, I've gotten pissed at him a few times and just been like, hey, fuck you, man. What is this? You, you were late or you said this. You shouldn't have said that. Da, da, da. That's bullshit. And get all mad. I'll go get all mad. Go be mad. And then I come back. Nothing changed for him. He doesn't need an apology that, like, oh, you overreacted. You were mad at me. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't right. want to say anything. He doesn't need to, like, even out with you. There's no, like, res right. there's no resolution that he needs from this. It's all right. fine. No, it doesn't seem like it. That's good. And the other day, I, I, I got in a conflict with somebody, and it was, it was his fault because he under-communicated, and it caused a conflict between me and someone else. Mm -hmm. And I could not bring myself to get mad at him about it. It's like, whatever. He wouldn't be mad at me if I did this. Right. He doesn't he give a shit. He already forgave himself before I told him about it, and he already forgave me for whatever I did, and he didn't tell me about Let's just right. go. <laughs> right, right. So I'm like, whatever, man. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, in, in the Lord's Prayer, we talked about this recently. In the Lord's Prayer, there's this part that's like, forgive everyone who I have debts against and forgive everybody that I that has a debt against me, just untie it all. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and I, I talked about it as a concept of karmic untangling. Untangle me karmically as I permit you, Lord, to per, to untangle everyone karmically who I have something against. Yeah. Like, I'm willing to drop everything if you drop everything against me and we just have a clean slate. That's like that mindset of no drama. Like that the Bhagavad Gita says, like, the man of yoga does not think about the consequences of his actions. Because it doesn't, like... That'd be thinking that's living in the future. And yeah. You will live there when you're there. Right. You'll get and if you live in there. the now, you'll mostly do really, really good things. So that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, totally. We usually do shitty things because we're obsessing over the past or the future. Right. Because you're afraid of something or you haven't forgiven someone for something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. To offer no resistance to life is to be in a state of grace, ease, and lightness. This state is then no longer dependent upon things being in a certain way, good or bad. It seems almost paradoxical, yet when your inner dependency on form is gone, the general conditions of your life, the outer forms, tend to improve greatly. Things, people, or conditions that you thought you needed for your happiness now come to you with no struggle or effort on your part, and you are free to enjoy and appreciate them while they last. All those things, of course, will still pass away, cycles will come and go, but with the dependency gone, there is no fear of loss anymore. Life flows with ease. The happiness that is derived from some secondary source is never very deep. 
It is only a pale reflection of the joy of being, the vibrant peace that you find within as enter, as you enter the state of non-resistance. Being takes you beyond the polar opposites of the mind and frees you from dependency on form. Even if everything were to collapse and crumble all around you, you would still feel a deep inner core of peace. You may not be happy, but you will be at peace. I really liked that distinction mm. of like peace being something deeper and better than happiness. Uh, and it, you know, it also is, of course, better than unhappiness, but it's something beyond both of those things and something uh, closer to God, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, do you think there's some feelings that are non-dual, as in feelings that don't have an opposite? Like, um, is that what they're saying peace is? Is that what they're saying peace is? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that they, um, I hope I'm not ma- mis- mixing it up with something you just said earlier in the podcast, but, uh, but I believe he did talk about how, like, all the things, I, I know I had read off one quote earlier on about, like, how love and peace and beauty and, uh, I can't think of more, but like those things all come from something deeper than forms and deeper than the world. Mm -hmm. And I believe he said he doesn't consider those things to have opposites, that those are just the default state of being. And it is always there, except sometimes you're making too much noise in your head to see that it's always there, that the love and beauty and peace is always there. Nothing can stop that. You can just forget about it because you're too distracted. Right, right. If you find your life situation unsatisfactory or even intolerable, it is only by surrendering first that you can break the unconscious resistance pattern that perpetuates that situation. Surrender is perfectly compatible with taking action, initiating change, or achieving goals. But in the surrendered state, a totally different energy, a different quality flows into your doing. Surrender reconnects you with the source energy of being. And if your doing is infused with being, it becomes a joyful celebration of life energy that takes you more deeply into the now. Through non-resistance, the quality of your consciousness and, therefore, the quality of whatever you are doing or creating is enhanced immeasurably. The results will then look after themselves and reflect that quality. We could call this surrendered action. It is not work as we have known it for thousands of years. As more humans awaken, the word work is going to disappear from our vocabulary, and perhaps a new word will be created to replace it. I really, uh, I enjoyed this. It made me think very much of like the idea of, and I suppose the whole book is kind of along the same lines, but this part made me think of the Wu Wei concept, which mm-hmm. I believe we, we just talked about in the last episode. Mm-hmm. Um, and the next quote actually goes more specifically into that. I want to share that too. What about non-resistance in the face of violence, aggression, and the like? Non-resistance doesn't necessarily mean doing nothing. All it means is that any doing becomes non-reactive. Remember the deep wisdom underlying the practice of Eastern martial arts. Don't resist the opponent's force. Yield to overcome. Oh. Having said that, doing nothing when you are in a state of intense presence is a very powerful transformer and healer of situations and people. In Taoism, there is a term called Wu Wei, which is usually translated as actionless activity or sitting quietly doing nothing. In ancient China, this was regarded as one of the highest achievements or virtues. It is radically different from inactivity in the ordinary state of consciousness or rather unconsciousness, which stems from fear, inertia, or indecision. The real doing nothing implies inner non-resistance and intense alertness. On the other hand, if action is required, you will no longer react from your conditioned mind, but you will respond to the situation out of your conscious presence. In that state, your mind is free of concepts, including the concept of nonviolence. So who can predict what you will do? So he's saying Interesting. that, like, no, you don't necessarily have to be, you don't have to, like, do nothing when you're getting hit by somebody but be totally present and make a conscious decision about what you're going to do there, which, you know, I was just about to say, but then as I, as I started to say it, it sounded wrong. Did Jesus actually say, don't, don't ever hit anybody? 
did he say don't hit? I don't think so. No, and he there's a story where he approached some Roman soldiers, and the advice that he gave them was not stop going to war. It was be content with your wages. So that was interesting. But he did say if somebody don't unionize. That's all he's got. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was advice for those specific people for some reason. Um, don't unionize. That's hilarious. <laughs> he said. He said if someone strikes you on the cheek, offer your other cheek to them. But who knows what the fuck he meant by that? Yeah. Let them slap you on the other cheek too. Because I do. I do see. I do see some, uh, I don't know, uh, like appeal. Like, I do see some merit to that sort of teaching of like, hey, just don't hit people. And if someone hits you, just let them hit you. And eventually they'll stop hitting you. And then they'll be like, what am I doing hitting people that don't even hit me back? Right. Like that, that is, that <laughs> does seem yeah. like if everybody agreed to do that. Well, well if everybody not, agreed to do anything, we'd be set. That's a good point. <laughs> uh, if we could agree on one thing. You know what's funny? Giovanni would always say, if everyone in the world smoked weed at the same time, there would be world peace for that moment. Well, if everyone yeah. played pool at the same time, there would be world peace for that moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just it's what their hands are doing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if everybody masturbated at the same time, there'd be just, world peace. You could, if anybody's doing everything, anybody's doing anything, we'll be fine. <laughs> but but I, no, I think if even 1% of the population agreed to just not resist anybody who did bad things to them, that, then that totally unconditional light would just blast out. And like the only reason not to do that is that there's something to protect. And so if, right. if Jesus yeah. was alluding to a non-dual state, then he may have been saying there's nothing to protect. Like you think that you're proving something but you're only proving, you're only validating the existence of form by proving that you can protect yourself as though there is something to protect in you. Yeah. And uh, people might just realize that this isn't real if you didn't feel the need to hit them back when they hit you. That's an interesting thought. Like, would Jesus have defended somebody else? Like, obviously we know he didn't hit anybody back when he was, I mean, you know, the story is that he didn't hit anybody back when he was getting crucified. But what if, like, what if someone, like, called his wife bald? Like, then what would he have done? You think? <laughs> so there was a scene where some kind of government henchman uh, sliced a sword at him and his homies, and it sliced Peter's ear. Is that his brother? No, no. his brother's name was James, or at okay. least one, the brother that is like a, a biblical character, okay. like wrote a book and, and everything is James. Um, Peter was just a close disciple or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, what he did was he healed his ear. He turned and healed his ear, and then he gave himself over to the soldiers to just end the situation. So that's what uh-huh. he would do if someone that he loved was attacked. He right. would heal them and then sacrifice himself to just smooth everything out. I forgot he's got that cheat code. Yeah. He could just heal. <laughs> if you looked in the mirror and did not like what you saw, you would have to be mad to attack the image in the mirror. That is precisely what you do when you are in a state of non-acceptance. And of course, if you attack the image, it attacks you back. If you accept the image, no matter what it is, if you become friendly toward it, it, can, it cannot not become friendly toward you. This is how you change the world. Just be friend, accept everything, be friendly with everything, mm. no matter how bad it is. And eventually, it'll all have to be friendly back. So remember what I said about Stanislav Grof? He approached the demon with friendly curiosity. Right. Yeah. And it had no choice but to just melt. Yeah, that does feel like it would be a good way to approach it. Like if a ghost, if a ghost, like, ooh, like, hey, whoa, what are you, a ghost? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> What's that like? Maybe that's why curious skeptics never ever have any supernatural experiences. They're like, that's fucking boring. I want to see some paranoid weirdo who's freaked out by ghosts. That's what I want to fuck with. I don't want to go fuck with a oh, right. yeah. friendly scientist who's going to ask me, about my surroundings and <laughs> yeah. where I am Maybe. and how long I've been there. Like, that's not interesting. <laughs> no, no one that's going to get data. 
Right, exactly. <laughs> Let's go get yeah. Data. Get stalked to the, by the ghosts. Right. All right, uh, last one. So this is in response to a longer part where somebody is asking about the way of the cross, which isn't a, a term that I've, like, I think I've, maybe I've heard it before, but it references, like, a, a specific kind of path to enlightenment. Mm -hmm. The way of the cross that you mentioned is the old way to enlightenment, and until recently, it was the only way. But don't dismiss it or underestimate its efficacy. It still works. The way of the cross is a complete reversal. It means that the worst thing in your life, your cross, turns into the best thing that ever happened to you by forcing you into surrender, into death, forcing you to become as nothing, to become as God, because God, too, is no thing. At this time, as far as the unconscious majority of humans is concerned, the way of the cross is still the only way. They will only awaken through further suffering, and enlightenment as a collective phenomenon will be predictably preceded by vast upheavals. This process reflects the workings of certain universal laws that govern the growth of consciousness and thus was foreseen by some seers. It is described, among other places, in the Book of Revelation or Apocalypse, though cloaked in obscure and sometimes impenetrable symbology. This suffering is inflicted not by God, but by humans on themselves and on each other, as well as by certain defensive measures that the Earth, which is a living, intelligent organism, is going to take to protect herself from the onslaught of human madness. He doesn't really elaborate on that, but that's something he holds true. Hmm. However, there is a growing number of humans alive today whose consciousness is sufficiently evolved not to need any more suffering before the realization of enlightenment. You may be one of them. I, I really liked that. I liked that as a, as a last quote as well. Like, uh, maybe you don't have to be miserable anymore. If you're listening mm -hmm. to this, maybe you do not have to be miserable anymore. Right. And maybe you can just accept everything. It is what it is. It's all good. Right. Because that is apparently a way to enlightenment. Yeah. I really liked this book. Uh, I recommend it for anybody that is, uh, I guess, seeking a deeper, or I guess maybe seeking is just kind of a fine way to say it. If yeah. you're seeking something, something spiritual. What are they seeking? <laughs> they're always seeking. They're always <laughs> looking at something. Uh, I definitely recommend the book. I thought it was I thought it was really cool. I think he has a really good way of, at least to me, this is a really good way of understanding concepts like this that I believe are buried in every religion of the world. Yeah. Uh, I just think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything else you want to say? Uh, well, I really appreciate you bringing up this book right now because I'm trying to find um, secular ways of describing high truths um, since I'm about to start working in an after-school program. And they're pretty flexible, like they'll let me teach meditation, mm -hmm. um, but I have to find ways to present ideas about meditation in ways that don't have direct religious affiliations. Right, you got to find different words to use. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I can use, they're cool with consciousness. Um, obviously, I, I'm not going to use God. Um is Muhammad cool? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, the minority religions are fine. That's fine. You just can't promote any majority religions. That's the deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this, is, this has lots of words. Lots of words that you can switch out for God and love or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because he tries to write this for a general audience. And, uh, and, but he, he had, he, that experience that he had was sincere it seems like and just opened him up to the deepest reality and I'm, I'm also curious about him waking up with the thought of the diamond in his head i know he associated the image of the diamond with the sound of the bird but the diamond image stands out to me because i've been working on this book called uh, diamonds from heaven mm -hmm. um lsd and the mind of the universe by chris botch and i just listened to a talk he did at ciis which is a rad school in california california institute of integral studies okay so they have um they they, they have a program there called Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness that was created by Richard Tarnas. Cool. Um, so they have all sorts of funky shit like that. And, they had Chris and what, was the, what was the book again that we covered? What was it called? Cosmos and Psyche. Cosmos and he also and did Passion, yeah. and Passion of the Western Mind. Cool. Um, so they, they have a lot of cool thought pioneers over at that school. And anyway, Chris Botts went and did a talk there, and he was talking about these levels of reality. 
um, that are like multiple transpersonal levels of reality that he was able to map out in some detail over 73 high dose LSD um, sessions. And the highest level he calls the diamond luminosity. And um, I think he also draws, I don't know, no, 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 I don't know this for sure, but uh, diamond way Buddhism is a form of Buddhism. I can't remember what I know okay. about that. But anyway, I just want to kind of put a bookmark on that for both of us. Like, what is this diamond concept and why is um, peak religious experiences associated with diamond? Yeah, that's interesting. It, it really seems like just a, a rock. Like, it's odd. It also implies that, like, it's a cut diamond, I assume. Like, a specific shape of diamond that doesn't occur naturally. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what that means. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see. You have anything else? No, sir. I'm good. Night school. Night school.